Welcome to the Vineyard Boise Sunday Message. You can join us live on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, and vineyardboise.org slash live. Subscribe to our message podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. And if you'd like to support Vineyard Boise, you can give online at vineyardboise.org slash give. Today's message is brought to you by Pastor Trevor Estes. Enjoy. We are, um, we're, we're kicking off a, uh, we're actually, we're pausing. We've been in the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark for uh, several, four or five months, I believe. Uh, we're pausing our study of the book of Mark for uh, the next several weeks. We're going to circle back to Mark in, I think, late September. Uh, but for now, we're pausing to do a couple of mini-series, to starting today with a three-part mini-series that we're calling Your Kingdom Come. So if we could put that graphic up, I want to just highlight a few things. So, so here's the, 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 the message over the next three weeks or the, the series. It's called Your Kingdom Come. I want you to notice the imagery in, in this slide. You've got the, uh, the Venn diagram with the kind of overlapping middle. That's not just a design element. That's actually crucial to uh, some of the things that we're going to be talking about over these next three weeks. So I just want you to dial that up to your awareness and kind of hold on to that. You're going to see that imagery um, repeated over the next three weeks. And, um, and I think it's going to be actually really helpful for us to understand who it is that we're called to be specifically as, um, as a vineyard church. And, and I think you're going to, um, I think it's going to be helpful for you. So um, so that's one thing. Secondly, I want to say this, this series that we're in, this three-part series, as we've talked about it and, and been praying as a pastoral team about what, is, what should this series be, we've described it as an appetizer. Okay? An appetizer. You think about the metaphor of an appetizer. How does an appetizer function? Well, it, does, it kind of can stand alone. Like you can, you, know, you can just eat an appetizer and be done. But generally speaking, an appetizer is designed to not fully satisfy your hunger. It's designed to kind of take the edge off and, and leave you still wanting more, leave you wanting the main course. In some cases, an appetizer can actually awaken your hunger and make you want the main course. Have you ever had that experience where you don't think you're hungry until you start to eat something and then realize, oh my gosh, I'm ravenous? Like that, I, that happens to me quite regularly. In fact, it happened last night. Uh, Andrea made these shrimp tostadas, and I didn't think I was that hungry until I ate the first bite, and then I, was, I needed to devour multiples. So that's our hope for this series, that it will, in fact, stand alone. We hope that, that, that if you, when you engage with this Sunday morning content, whether you're doing that from home at a distance, whether you're doing that on campus, that it, it will, in fact, be in and of itself something that you can take in and be nourished by. But we also recognize there's so much more that we want regarding this message of your kingdom come that we can't possibly do in just a few weeks. And so there's more coming. There's a main course that you're going to hear more about that we want to invite you to. And our, our prayer is that this would actually awaken a hunger and an expectation in us that makes us want the main course. Okay? So you're going to hear a little bit about that this morning from, from Pastor Jesse. So... Um, we began this morning. If you weren't here right when we started worship, we began the morning by praying uh, what's, what's commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. We like to call it the Disciples' Prayer. Uh, and, you know, that's a prayer that, that you know, we studied it, I don't know, I sort of lost track of time anymore. I, I, the last 2020 sort of messed with me. I think some back in 2019, I think. We, we studied through the Lord's Prayer line by line. And one of the things we saw is that, is that Jesus' disciples, they, they, were, they were, you know, they'd grown up in Hebrew homes and Jewish homes. They were praying boys. Uh, and yet they recognized something in Jesus' prayer life that was different than theirs. Something that made them long for something more. They saw something in him. His prayer life was, uh, was, was deeper, richer, uh, more effective, uh, something more intimate. Something about his prayer life made them want to learn how to pray the way he prayed. Almost to where they would say, we don't think we even know how to pray when we see what, what your prayer life looks like. So they came to him and they said, would you teach us how to pray? And he gave them the, the prayer we know as the Lord's Prayer. And it's a, it really is a prayer that's designed to be prayed every single day. It's not just a prayer for special occasions, for 
you know, I don't know, somber occasions or certain gatherings or funerals. <laughs> it's actually designed to be prayed every day. Give us today our daily bread. So it's, it's an orientation towards, towards God and towards the world that Jesus was hoping his followers would embrace and begin to live out of. And so this is really important for us. And what we saw in that series is that it wasn't just designed to be prayed like a script, but every one of those, there's, it's, a, it's a series of petitions, a series of, of asks, of requests. And each one is, is, is a, like a framework that we can then flesh out with our, what's going on in and through our lives that day. Okay, so that said, there's this line pretty early on. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know that line? What does that mean? <laughs> we say it and we can recite it, but what does it actually mean? Here's what I find. I find that there's sometimes I, th I think I know what something means until I go to articulate it and I realize, actually, I don't really know what that means. It's fuzzy. Like, I have a sense of what it means, but it's kind of fuzzy. I grew up, I, I, I learned that prayer first at my grandparents' house, and so I learned to recite it. But I could recite it and quote it long before I had any sort of comprehension of what it actually means. And here's, here's the reason why. Um, well, if you're, if you're, let me pause right here. If you're in the vineyard, that, that line, your kingdom come, you're going to hear that repeatedly. It's part of our, it, it informs our prayer life. Today, it was in some of the songs we sang. We sang about the kingdom of God coming or advancing or expanding. Like we, are, we, we call ourselves a kingdom people, so it informs our theology. It informs our eschatology. We would say that our, our eschatology, our view of the end times, is a, is a kingdom theology. It's about the, the kingdom of God that has broken in and will be consummated. And so this word kingdom is pretty important for us. In fact, I pulled this statement out of, the, out of a vineyard uh, publication. So, so if, you don't, if you're not familiar with this, Vineyard Boise is just one church that's part of an association. There's, I think, like 600 in the U.S. and then another 1,200 global or something like that. So we're part of association. This is a statement that came, came out of a, a core values and beliefs booklet. Vineyard is a movement distinctly centered in a renewed understanding of the centrality of the kingdom of God in biblical thought. We view the kingdom of God as the overarching and integrating theme of the whole Bible. Let me just repeat that. We view the kingdom of God as the overarching and integrating theme of the whole Bible. Vineyard is committed to the theology and the practice. There's the two important components. The theology and the practice of the kingdom of God, rooted in the vision of the Hebrew prophets and fulfilled in the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. We've been commissioned to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, bearing witness to the already and the not yet of the kingdom in both word and deeds. So that's part of the vineyard. And Part of this series is we just want to pause and talk about that. You know, sometimes uh, there's language that we use and we kind of assume that everybody knows what it is. And sometimes it's actually helpful to stop and actually talk about it. What, what is that? Because kingdom is not part of our American vernacular in the 21st century, is it? Like, if you hear about kingdom outside of a, a spiritual family environment, what, what are people probably talking about? I got a couple options for you. What is it? Okay, one is, yeah. So, yes, I'm going to come to that one, but it's out of order in my slides. So, <laughs> so yes, but first, let's go Magic Kingdom, right? We're thinking, we're thinking Disney World. This is actually a, a, a picture that was taken just two nights ago because Disney World has brought back fireworks in anticipation of the 4th of July and excitement and all that. So, so yes, Magic Kingdom. And along that same kind of vein, we can think about kingdoms when we think about like fairy tales like King Arthur or movies about Elsa and Anna <laughs> and their wonderful kingdom of what? Airedale, yes. Eternal winter. So, <laughs> 
So there's those connotations, right? Magic Kingdom, fairy tales, uh, movies. There, that's, kingdom gets used that way. Also, for less fictional connotations, we might think of current day stories about the British monarchy or the geographical territory of the United Kingdom. So let's put up that map. And yes, you are correct. We think of United Kingdom. And here's, now, here's important that we realize this because when we think about the United Kingdom, we're thinking about a geographical boundary. Okay, we're thinking about the, the countries that exist within that geographical designation of the United Kingdom. And we're thinking about the people that live inside of that. Right? So you could talk about, you could use the word kingdom to describe both of those. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we're not, we're not talking about fairy tales. We're not talking about Disneyland or Disney World. We're not talking about uh, Aradel. And we're not talking about something that can be constricted to a geographical boundary or the people that live within that. We're talking about something that is, that is expanding and, and, and extending throughout the world. So um, this, the, the meaning of the kingdom of God, it's one that is packed with both theological expectation and practical consequence. So back in that statement of faith about the vineyard, we talked about both the theology and the practice. Okay, so this is, this is something that's both theological and it's very practical in terms of its implications. So let's take a look. First of all, um, all we're doing is a quick overview right now, but Jesus, when he arrived, and we saw this you know, when we began the book of Mark, the very opening uh, verses of the book of Mark introduced the kingdom of God as the central message of Jesus' ministry. This is how it went. Mark 1.14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Good, remember this, good news, the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Okay, you just hear that. Jesus said the kingdom of God has come near. He's not talking about uh, moving a geographical line. And he's not just talking about people. He's talking about something beyond that. His primary message was that in his person and in his ministry, the kingdom of God was, was breaking into the human realm and the human experience. Something was breaking in, in in a way that hadn't been present. So whenever Jesus taught, so that's the overarching, that's kind of like the banner over Jesus' ministry. And so everything he says or does after that has to do with the kingdom of God. When he taught, he was explaining, here's how the kingdom of God is different than what you've experienced. When he, his parables, his stories, his, uh, his metaphors, everything he said, he was explaining what life is like in the kingdom of God and how it's different than life apart from the kingdom of God. So that's when he taught, when he performed miracles, when he did things like performing miracles, those were demonstrations. Those were like down payments or little installments of the kingdom of God breaking in. In a, in a significant way. So what did, what did Jesus then mean by the kingdom of God? Here's a, just a simple definition for you. Simple definition. The kingdom of God it describes the dynamic reign or the active, dynamic, active. The active reign or rule of the king. Okay? Talk about the kingdom of God. We're talking about a, the, the rule of the king. Simply put, this is Rich Nathan had a, a really simple definition I've got written up on my wall over one of my offices. The kingdom of God is what things would be like if Jesus ran everything and if his will was done everywhere. The kingdom of God is what things would be like if Jesus were in charge. Okay? That's, so, so when Jesus proclaims that the, the kingdom of God has come near, he's talking about the fact that God's will is not always what's done on this planet. But there's coming a time where, where God's will will be accomplished, where God's will will break into circumstances and lives and environments, even into lands and places and people. But here's the thing, and here's why it makes it fuzzy. Because Jesus talked about the kingdom of God as if it was something that was both present tense, that it had arrived in his ministry in person, but also that it was something that was in the future. He talked about it as if it was both now and also not yet. Jesus talked about the fact that the kingdom of God had broken in, is breaking in, and will be completed in one day and sometime. 
So here's what that means. The dynamic and active will of God is not limited to a people or place. It has arrived, but it's still expanding. It's still extending. It's, it's working its way into the world. And there will come a day when all things will be made right. But right now there's this tension. The kingdom of God is breaking in, but, but it's still breaking into a world that's fallen. Which is why Jesus instructed his first followers that even after he had returned to the Father and he entrusted the gospel to them, that they were to keep going out and extending the kingdom. He, kept, he told them to proclaim the same message that he had proclaimed and to expect the same sort of results, the same sort of accompanying signs, right? Matthew 10, 7, Jesus said to them, as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Jesus just gave them the same commission that he'd been operating out of, right? And so that's why he taught them in their daily prayers. He said, this is a part of your expectation, something that you can't do on your own strength. You have to ask for this, but part of your expectation is that every day the kingdom of God would, would come into your life and move through your life into the world, expanding and extending into the world around you. He taught them to ask for that, which creates a certain expectation. We're going we're gonna to watch a video from our friends at the Bible Project. Uh, these guys are absolutely amazing. This is a, this is a ministry that's based in Portland. Um, just fantastic. Actually, uh, Tim Mackey, the, the lead guy at Bible Project, is actually going to be speaking to our vineyard um, gathering in Phoenix in November. We're pretty excited to have him speaking to us because um, they, they share what we would call a kingdom theology. So this is a video that we're going to show that um, it just further clarifies with a really helpful and concise explanation and imagery. So in the Bible, the... <laughs> apparently my introduction is too long. <laughs> further understanding the idea of the kingdom of God on earth. So here's... May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This video unpacks that for us. So in the Bible, the ideas of heaven and earth are ways of talking about God's space and our space. So I understand our space really well. We live here, there's trees, rivers, mountains, but my understanding of God's space gets a little fuzzy. And what we do get in the Bible are images trying to help us grasp God's space, which is basically inconceivable to us. So these are two very different types of spaces. Yes, they're, they're different in their nature, but here's what's really interesting is that in the Bible, these are not always separate spaces. So think of heaven and earth as like different dimensions that can overlap in the same exact space. So we talk a lot about going to heaven after we die, but this idea of heaven and earth overlapping, we don't talk a lot about that. Which is kind of crazy because the union of heaven and earth is what the story of the Bible is all about. How they were once fully united and then driven apart and about how God is bringing them back together once again. So let's go back to the beginning where heaven and earth, they're completely overlapping. Yeah, this is what uh, the Bible's description of the Garden of Eden is all about. It's a place where God and humanity dwelt together, perfectly no separation, and, and humans then partner with God in building a flourishing, beautiful world and so on. But as humans, we wanted to do things a different way. We wanted God out and we wanted to create a world apart from him. Yeah, so we have these two spaces now. And the Bible actually uses lots of different kinds of words and phrases to refer to these two spaces to make a, a clear distinction. So you've said that these spaces can overlap though. So explain how that works. Yeah, this is where we have to start talking about temples. Because in the biblical world, you experience God's presence by going to a temple. That's where heaven and earth uh, overlap. Now, there are two types of temples described in the Bible. One is a tabernacle, basically a tent that was built by Moses. And the other was this massive building made by Solomon. And these temples were decorated with fruit trees and flowers and images of angels and all kinds of gold and jewels and so on. And these are designed to make you feel like you're going back to the garden. And at the center of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies, which was like the hot spot of God's presence. Now we can go and be with God again. 
but not so fast because the temple also creates a problem. So, God's space is full of his presence and goodness and justice and beauty, but human space is full of sin and injustice and the ugliness that results. So, how do these spaces overlap if they're so different and they're in conflict with each other? This was resolved through animal sacrifice. Yeah, that's kind of weird. What do animal sacrifices have to do with this? Yeah, the the idea is this. Animal sacrifices, somehow they absorb the sin when the animal dies in your place. And it creates a clean space, so to speak, where you are now free to enter into the temple and be in God's presence. Okay, so if I'm an Israelite and I live in Jerusalem, I might be able to be in God's presence. But you said the story of the Bible is all of heaven and earth reuniting. Right. So, we have to keep going in the story where we come to Jesus in the New Testament. And in the Gospel of John, we hear this claim that God became human in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. Now, this word dwelling is really curious. It, literally, it means he set up a tabernacle among us. And so, what John is claiming right here is that Jesus is a temple. He is now the place where heaven and earth overlap. What's interesting about Jesus is that he isn't staying in this safe, clean space. He's running around, hanging out with sinners. He's healing people of their sicknesses and forgiving people of their sins. He's basically creating little pockets of heaven where people can be in God's presence, but he's doing it out there in the middle of the world of sin and death. And he keeps telling everyone that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he even told his followers to pray regularly that God's kingdom come and that his will be done here on earth, just as it is in heaven. But a lot of people are threatened by Jesus and they kill him, which seems to spoil this whole plan to reunite heaven and earth. But we we have to go back to a scene earlier on in Jesus' story where John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, Jesus isn't just talked about as being a temple, he's also talked about as being the temple sacrifice. Yeah, so so the cross is now the place where Jesus absorbs sin to create a clean space that is not limited like animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice has the power to keep spreading and spreading and reuniting more and more of heaven and earth. And this is all really great, but it leaves one big question in my mind, which is, what happens when I die? Don't I just fly over to God's space to be with Jesus. Yeah, so a few times in the New Testament, we learn that Christians will be with Jesus in heaven after they die, but that is not the focus of the Bible's story. The focus is on how heaven and earth are being reunited through Jesus and will be completely brought together one day when he returns. So, in the book of Revelation, we get this beautiful image of the Garden of Eden, now in the form of a city, coming to end the age of sin and death by redeeming all of human history in a renewed creation. And God's space and human space completely overlap once again. Whoa, that's a lot. As I reviewed that video this week, I got sucked into the Bible Project like I often do, and I went down that rabbit trail for, I'm not even going to say how long, because it was too long. But anyway, I, um, I, that makes me so thankful for Jesus, to see how the sin of the world is put on him, your sin, my sin, laid on him to establish the kingdom of God on the earth today. What, what a beautiful, beautiful picture. Pastor Trevor talked about that this, is, this series is an appetizer. It's an appetizer. Well, I'm up here because we decided it's not just an appetizer, but we like ourselves a good sampler platter. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I can totally get behind a sampler platter any day of the week. Uh, it's like, oh, I don't know. Do I need the cheese sticks? Do I need the bread sticks? Always get the breadsticks, always get the cheese sticks, but what else could I throw in there? Oh, poppers, sounds good. I'll have the sampler platter. It's not, you, you can't just limit your appetizer to one, th I mean, yeah, shrimp sounds good, but so do cheese sticks. So you throw it all in, sampler platter. So that's where you have me up here today because we decided to give you a little bit of everything this morning. 
<laughs> now I'm really hungry. <laughs> But I want, I, can we put up that first graphic I have there of the cross? You know, there's this, there's this picture that they show here that the sin of the world laid on the cross, laid on Jesus Christ through the cross, redeems the world and establishes his kingdom on earth. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful picture. And then next we have this, this picture here, that one, yep, yeah, where, see all those little, those little dots? where the kingdom of God advances into the rest of the world. And somewhere between the cross and that advancing of the kingdom to those pockets throughout the world, something happened. Something happens there that it's not just, yeah, the, 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 the forgiveness of Jesus, yeah, that does it. But Jesus also said something Jesus says that he's going to send a helper. He's going to send the helper. He's going to send the Holy Spirit. And he actually says it's better, Jesus said, it's actually better if I go so that he can come because then when the Holy Spirit comes, it, you'll receive power. You'll receive, he says in Acts chapter one, uh, you'll receive, when the Holy Spirit comes, you'll receive power. You'll receive power. Power to do what? Power to do what that little graphic just showed. Take what Jesus did into the rest of the world to establish his kingdom everywhere we go. That's what we're, that's what we're designed to do. And now Jesus also said, and now you, you are the, actually, it says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You and I are carriers of his spirit into the world to establish his kingdom on earth. That's how his kingdom comes. That's how his will is done. It's not magic. It's the Holy Spirit. We don't have to hope it happens. We do it. We don't have to be like, well, your kingdom come, your will be done, Lord. I hope it gets done. No, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And then under the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we receive it and we go and we do it. We do the things that he said we would do. Exactly what was on that list. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Am I talking to anybody today? Don't worry, we're going to get you out of here for your barbecue. Trust me. <laughs> the power of the Holy Spirit is, is the thing that takes us from Jesus' ascension from the earth after he, was, after he rose from the dead to today and establishing his kingdom in the earth. The Holy Spirit, the empowering work of the Holy Spirit is what does that today. Listen, in Acts chapter two, verses one through four, Acts chapter two says this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered in one place. Jesus said, go, go to Jerusalem and wait. That's what Jesus told the guys to do. He's like, hey, listen, fellas, go to Jerusalem, gather together and wait. They wait there until Pentecost. And at the Feast of Pentecost, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. Everybody say fire. fire. That separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit, everybody say Spirit, Spirit, enabled them. So as the Spirit enabled them, they, and, and so then what we see happening after this is everybody in Jerusalem was confused. They were like, hey, what are these guys doing? What's going on? Why are they so crazy? What is wrong with these people? And, and Peter stands up, filled with the Holy Spirit, and says, hey, here's what's happening. And he lays out a sermon that everyone in Jerusalem understood that day. And the Bible says 3,000 people get saved and are added to their number that day because of the power of the Holy Spirit. They go from 100 or so people to over 3,000 people in one day. I would say that is a kingdom advancing kind of day, right? What was the difference between the sacrifice of Jesus happening and 3,000 people being added to the church that day? the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. 
That is what God has given us. He says, I'm sending you a helper. In, in, the, in uh, John chapter 15, it says, uh, I will send you a helper. I will send you a helper, Jesus says. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power to advance the kingdom of God in the earth today. And so we're going to, like I said, we have a little bit of a sampler platter going on. I want Pastor Jesse to come up and just tell you about an opportunity that's coming up uh, around here. And then we are going to, um, we're going to do something a little bit different today. We're going to talk for a few more minutes about the Holy Spirit. And then we're just going to pray together and see what God wants to do. Can we do that? All right. All right, so Pastor Trevor's the breadsticks, Brent is the cheese sticks, I guess I'm the jalapeno poppers. Is that what it is? Because I'll take it. Actually, I think out of those three, I'd pick poppers any day, right? Who's with me on that? Um, so if, if we're gonna be telling cheesy jokes, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take it further. Because <laughs> what I, what I wanna share is we're actually gonna be starting a driver's education program here at Vineyard Boise. And here's what I mean by that. So Brent was saying that everybody, you know, that God's not partial with who he pours out the Spirit on, right? He's not partial. He pours it out on everybody who wants it. But here's the thing. A lot of times we understand, that we understand like the theology of the kingdom, but we don't do anything with it. We don't actually practice it. And so it's sort of like if God gave every one of you guys a car and it was super shiny, it looked really good, and you're like, I just don't think I ever want to take it out of the garage. <laughs> and so what we want to do is like, we want, to, we want to practice, we want to use the gifts that God's given us. We want to take the car out of the garage, but first we need to take driver's ed, right? Right? So, so that's the joke, driver's ed, who wants to take driver's ed? Let's do it. But here we go. So, so what I, we're not actually doing driver's ed. What we're going to do, <laughs> what I'm excited to let you guys know is that we're launching School of Kingdom Ministry. And so in the vineyard, we have this, we have this saying, John Wimber, who really helped found the vineyard, he, uh, he liked to say, you know, in his experience, he was like, when are we going to do the stuff? When are we going to do the stuff that Jesus did? Like he read the Bible. He was in a church that was, you know, just, what, I won't, I don't know, but they weren't doing the stuff. He's like, when, we, when do we get to do the stuff that Brent just said? When do we get to pray for the sick? When do we get to, um, you know, cast out demons? All this stuff that Jesus did. And he said, if, you, if you're my follower, you're going to do this stuff too. When do we get to do the stuff? And another saying that we like to say in the vineyard is everybody gets to play. Okay. So this isn't just something for specialists. This isn't just something for the breadsticks and the cheese sticks and the jalapeno poppers. It's for, it's for everybody. But there is something to like to, to walking this out and practicing it. And so if everybody gets to play, we also believe like everybody needs to get trained. Amen? Because there's, there's something to this being, you know, the power is, is the Holy Spirit filling us up. But then there's a process to this. And the, the real emphasis I want to, I don't, I'm not going to go into a ton of details today, but what I, I just want to emphasize is that the School of Kingdom Ministry is not primarily about absorbing information, okay? That's part of it, but it's actually about gaining skills. And it's kind of, that's a different way to look at it, but what we want to do is actually gain skills of walking out kingdom ministry in real life, in real life. So taking that, that stuff that we know in our heads and putting it into practice. So every class that we do is going to have some, you're going to get some information, but it's also very active, very practical. We're going to like put stuff into play. We're going to be um, practicing kingdom ministry with one another, and then we're going to be going out as well. And without get, getting too bogged down in the details, this is not like an everyday school. Like if you're signing up for this, it's like you got to come here every day. It's just once a week for three hours. We will get more into the details, but the one date I want to give you is July 18th. Okay, so if this is at all kind of stirring your heart a little bit, July 18th, that's two Sundays from now. So not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that, Sunday, July 18th, we're going to have an information meeting um, after church at noon. And we are going to provide some pizza for you. Maybe some jalapeno poppers. I don't know. But definitely pizza. Um, so July 18th, uh, we're going to be meeting in the chapel. 
And we're gonna basically share the whole vision and heart of the School of Kingdom ministry. This is, we're actually gonna be joining a part of 160 other churches that are running this program. Um, it was birthed in a vineyard in Illinois. And so we're kind of joining on with what they've already um, been, you know, this really awesome program that they have. And then we'll be, you know, joining with them. And so it's kind of virtual, but it's all in person as well. So we'll get all those details to you July 18th, right after church. And if you are interested, what I'd like you to do, Terry, could you stand up? Everybody give it up for Terry. Um, Terry is on our leadership team with, uh, with School of Kingdom Ministry, and he's going to be at a table out in Heritage Hall. So we've got some information for you out there, and we'd love to have you just sign a list that says you're interested so we can get your email address and get you more information. And I think with that, we're just going to roll a video about School of Kingdom Ministry, and then Brent's going to come back up and close us out. There is something inside all of us that calls out for more. An ache, a wonder, a drawing into discovering the fullness of this life. The church is the light of the world and the hope to the nations. Join us on a journey of discovering our identity, calling, and purpose in Jesus Christ. We as a family of believers all over the world can unite within our communities to learn the mind of Christ, communicate the heart of the Father, and partner with the power of the Holy Spirit to see lives and cities, nations transform. The school is centered around teaching that will restore us to our true identity in Jesus Christ. We learn how to partner with the Holy Spirit to live a naturally supernatural life. The heart of the School of Kingdom Ministry is to train and equip the body of Christ in our local churches so we can learn to move in love and power in the Kingdom of God with the people we know and trust. Let's be transformed and sent out together. It's, it's going to be fine. <laughs> I would say it was my kid that pulled it, but my kids aren't here today. <laughs> Typically, it would be mine. So, yeah, can we keep rolling the video if they can handle it? Can you guys handle it? Sorry. The video is over? Oh. Okay. <laughs> well... You know, we had like a bunch of people say God was going to do something today. <laughs> I had a bunch of prophetic people come up and say God was going to do something today. And so I'm believing God's going to do something today. No matter what the fire alarm's saying. If you can't handle it, that's totally fine. There's ju no judgment, but... I know we're talking about a lot of things today. We're talking about the School of Kingdom Ministry. We're talking about the kingdom. But the reason we're talking about that is because that's what we're a part of. We're a part of the kingdom. And our responsibility, our role is to advance the kingdom of God in the earth today. To do this stuff. You know, I just keep hearing over and over God saying, I want to do something. I want to do something. God's desire is to do something. Joel chapter 2 in the Old Testament says that in those days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I'm believing that these are those days. God's not finished with us. And I'm not just talking about today in church. What I'm talking about is that God would continue his work in the earth today through us. The Holy Spirit is not here to bring a blessing to me or to, he does that. 
That is, that is what happens. But that's not what it's for. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God who is wanting to do something today in the earth through his people. And you know, anytime God wants to do something, he sends the Holy Spirit through his people. You know, it's interesting. The, the most physical work God may have ever done that we know about is described in creation, Genesis chapter one. God creates everything. God makes everything from nothing. He creates everything. He makes everything from nothing. He does all of this work. He works for six days, however you want to interpret that, and then rests for a day. And he does all of this work f with nothing. But do you know what he does before? You know what it says before all of this work? Let's read it. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. You see, there's this moment before God gets to work where the Spirit is there and the Spirit arrives on the scene and is hovering over all of the darkness, all of the blackness that's happening in the earth. And suddenly, when the Spirit arrives on the scene, there's a burst of creation, a burst of building, a burst of advancing. I'm believing that for us today. I'm believing that for us today, that there will be that burst of creativity, that burst of creation, that burst of advancement of the kingdom, that burst of creation today. And how does that happen? The Holy Spirit, just as described in Genesis chapter one, the Spirit. Let's stand together. If you need to just close your eyes so you don't see these strobe lights, do that. <laughs> Whenever God has great plans, it begins with the Spirit. Whenever God has great plans, it begins with the Holy Spirit. Today, in the earth, God has great plans, and they begin with the Holy Spirit. In you, in your heart, in your life, today. Today, I need an infilling of the Holy Spirit. Today, you need an infilling of the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, people get a little bit weird and they think, oh my gosh, it's gonna get a little bit strange. It's gonna get a little bit crazy. It's gonna get, you know, we just need to have, like the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we need to do everything decently and we need to do everything in order. And I wanna propose to you that when the Holy Spirit arrives in church or arrives on the scene or arrives in creation or arrives in your life, that is when things actually get done decently and in order because it's His way. The Holy Spirit is God. And if you don't think that when He arrives on the scene, things don't shape up, we're maybe talking about two different things. See, I believe that when the power and presence of the living God arrive in the form of the Holy Spirit, things actually begin to go the way He designed them to. Prophecy, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, dreams, visions, encouragement, teaching, hospitality, administration, all of these things are gifts that come, the Bible says, from the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I want that. I don't know about you, but I need that. I have to have that. You see, as the church, we cannot advance the kingdom in any effective way at all without the power of the Holy Spirit. Just like he was there at creation, building, designing, doing incredible things. Today, he's here in this place, hovering over the darkness of our planet saying, let me in. I'm ready to work through you. Let me in. I'm ready to burst into creativity and make my kingdom move through you. I want to do that. I want to see blind eyes open. 
I want to see people healed of cancer and disease. I want to see the dead rise. I want to have dreams and visions for my family and my kids and my community and my city. I want to see God do things that he's ready to do in my day. And so that's why I pray, don't pass me by. Holy Spirit, don't pass me by. So today we're going to pray for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray for a couple of things. One of them is, the, is a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. Also, there's some some, some of you here today that you need a word from God. You need to hear from God. And we have a team of people that's been praying for you this week that wants God to speak to you. And we're just going to see what God will do. So right now, all over this room, will you just close your eyes and extend your hands out in front of you? Listen, if you don't know Jesus like we're talking about him today and you would say, hey, I, I, I don't even know this Holy Spirit part. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I know that I'm here today and I, I feel like I need Jesus. We want to pray for you today. Maybe your heart is far from God and you've, you've wandered from God and today you're saying, I, I'm back. I, I want to move forward with God. If that's you today, we, we want to pray with you. And so I'm going to pray for you right now. Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would meet with every heart. Meet with every heart. Lord Jesus, would you come and reconcile us to you today? And those that are afar off and don't know you or have gone off and now are returning to you, would you, Lord, today be their Lord and their Savior? Lord, forgive us of all of our sin. Wash us. Make us a new creation in Christ Jesus and be our Lord and our King today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we're going to pray because I believe today if you, you would say, I need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's me today. I, 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 I'm ready to do the stuff. I'm ready to step out and see God do something through me. Let's just lift our hands in here. Joel chapter two says, in those days, I'm gonna pour out my spirit on all flesh. I'm all flesh, you're all flesh. That's us. That's you and I. That's you, that's me. It's for us today. The fresh empowering grace of the Holy Spirit is here today. And he wants to do something in you and I today. And so as I'm praying, would you just say, Lord, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Fill me with your Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Acts chapter two, they were all in one accord. They were all in one room together. And the Bible says that as we read earlier, the, a mighty rushing wind came in and fire separated out over each of their heads, just like it did at the temple of Solomon, just like it did at the tabernacle, just like it did when it led the children of Israel out of Egypt. The Spirit of God arrives on the scene and changes things forever. And so that's what we're asking for. We're saying a Holy Spirit come. Holy Spirit, come burn in us again. Oh, ignite my heart of flame again. If I've grown cold, ignite my heart of flame again. I'm ready to dream dreams. I'm ready to see visions. I'm ready to see the sick healed. I'm ready to see the blind see. I'm ready to see the lame walk. I'm ready to see the dead raised to life. I'm ready to see your kingdom, God, advance. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth in Garden City as it is in heaven. I'm ready to see that happen, God. So fill us today, God, we ask. Would you fill us with your Holy Spirit today, we ask. Fill us with your Holy Spirit today. Just extend your hands and say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Listen, the Bible says nobody touched them. No one went around and laid hands on anybody. God just did it. So come on, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, fill us.
to stand right where you sit. We're meeting with God this morning at home in your living room, wherever you are today. God is here to meet with you. God is here to meet with you by the power of his Holy Spirit. We need you, God. says in Acts chapter 2 that they were all in one accord. That means they were all in agreement. You know, sometimes it's important in a conversation to let somebody know that you agree with them. I agree with you. Today we're in agreement with God. And so if that's you today and you're just saying, hey, I need my heart to come into agreement with God, with what God wants to do. I don't want what I want. I want what God wants. Because what God wants for my life, for my marriage, for my family, for my city, for my nation, for the nations of the world, what God wants is so far superior to what I want. Just like that video we watched earlier where we begin to partner with God in moving his kingdom forward. Can we just say, God, we agree with you. I agree, God. Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit today? I want to come into agreement with what you want at Vineyard Boise, in Garden City. In every church that's represented here today, in my living room, in my home, in my hospital room, right now where I am, I want to come into agreement with you, God. Not my own way. Not our own ways, God. Your ways. Not our own way, but your Holy Spirit. you this morning and you just say, I, not my own way, God, but your way, I agree. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Would you just come, if you're able, would you just come forward this morning? We're going to sing this song again, and I, God's not finished yet this morning. If that's you and you just say, I, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit in a fresh way, in a new way. God, I'm coming into agreement with you today. That's what I want. It, and, you, and you're able, would you just come, come forward this morning? We're going to sing this together. Thanks for watching. To respond or receive prayer after the live stream closes, please email prayer at vineyardboise.org. And if possible, include your phone number. We'd love to get in touch with you. Thanks.